Hey guys, today I'll show you a zombie horror thriller TV series named The Walking Dead Daryl Dixon Season 1. Spoilers ahead, watch out and take care. The drama takes place on the boundless Pacific Ocean where a solitary Tesla boat without battery drifted aimlessly. The man named Daryl, who had survived the outbreak of the zombie virus, was exhausted and disoriented and had no idea how long he had been at sea. Fortunately, the currents eventually guided his manual boat to a sandy beach. With his last ounce of strength, Daryl managed to crawl ashore, drank some rainwater to replenish his energy, and then headed inland. The landscape was filled with ruins and desolation. After years of devastation caused by the zombie virus, human society had collapsed, and even this city, far across the ocean, had not been spared. Daryl wandered the streets alone like the last survivor. In a fishing boat, he found some supplies and a tape recorder. It's a final message left by the boat's previous owner. It turned out he was in Marseille, France's second-largest city, where the owner had tragically killed his own family due to the virus, a fate shared by many of its residents. After resting for the night on the boat, Daryl, armed with a harpoon pulled from a zombie, continued on his journey, not forgetting his mission, which is to find his lost friend Rick, as he represented a hope for survival in this apocalypse. Daryl left a message on the recorder. Even if he couldn't return, at least he had tried for hope. The desolate scenery mirrored his lonely silhouette, echoing the city's former prosperity. After several days of trekking, Daryl finally arrived at a small town. Following graffiti on the walls, he located a survivor camp, but it was abandoned. As Daryl was gathering more supplies, the noise awoke the cornered zombies who began to stir. Despite losing his crossbow, Daryl, known for his combat skills, quickly dispatched the zombies. These zombies were unusual, their fluids were highly corrosive, and Daryl's arm, wounded in the fight, began to decay rapidly. He washed it with water and wrapped it in gauze. After some time, Daryl reached a dilapidated village where he finally encountered other humans. A woman who spoke some English began to communicate with Daryl simply. She revealed an elderly man needed urgent medication for a leg injury. They offered food in exchange for medical supplies, which Daryl retrieved from his boat. Just then, a pickup truck pulled up, and two men with rifles jumped out, seizing everyone's supplies and attempting to abduct the woman. Unable to stand idly by, Daryl stabbed one man in the neck. As the other assailant fired at him, the woman knocked him down with a hammer. Daryl picked up the gun to finish the job, but the woman urged him not to waste bullets. As Daryl was tending to his wounds, the elderly man suddenly attacked him with a hammer. Daryl's vision blurred as the woman took all the supplies and was about to finish him off when a figure appeared in the distance and fired a shot, scaring off the woman and her accomplice. Daryl then lost consciousness. In his sleep, he seemed to hear Rick's daughter and wife's plea to bring Rick back. He was awakened by a sharp pain in his arm, only to see two nuns holding a red-hot iron before passing out again. When Daryl woke up the next day, he felt significantly better. After asking around, he found out that it was Sister Isabel who had rescued him and brought him back to the convent. The previous night, she had used a branding iron on his arm to remove the zombie virus, a common local treatment method. Later, Isabel drew a bath for Daryl, and as she saw the numerous fierce scars on his body, she commented that they were signs of past sufferings, now healed. Daryl, head bowed, remained silent. As long as the zombie apocalypse continued, the scars on his back would only multiply. After changing into clean clothes, Isabel led him on a tour of the convent, revealing a surprising find, an armory filled with various types of melee weapons. Even nuns needed to know how to defend themselves in these times. Isabel mentioned that there used to be a priest here, but he had unfortunately been infected by the virus and had left behind a young boy. In the spacious garden of the convent, a variety of fruits and vegetables were grown, enough to be self-sufficient. If left undisturbed, this place was an ideal refuge. Curious, Daryl looked around and noticed a young boy behaving oddly, mimicking his every move. Soon, the boy approached Daryl and struck up a conversation. His name was Laurent, the only male in the convent. The priest had taught him much, including psychology. Laurent said that Daryl's actions radiated loneliness and solitude. He then took Daryl's hand, attempting to offer some psychological comfort, until a nun reminded them that it was time for poetry recitation. Curiously following Laurent, Daryl saw him speaking verses to a zombie. Laurent explained that the poetry could restore sanity to the zombies. Chilled through the bone to his butt, Daryl realized that something was definitely off about the convent. 
he decided to pack up and leave immediately. Isabel hurried over to stop him, claiming that Daryl was meant to escort Laurent as a messenger. She then unfolded a drawing in her hands, showing a man on the beach. It's Daryl, as he had been when washed ashore. Seeing Daryl's puzzled expression, Isabel continued her explanation. A saint had once prophesied that Laurent would grow up in a northern community to become Misael, a leader who would spearhead humanity's revival. Originally, the priest was supposed to escort him to the northern community, but he had unfortunately contracted the zombie virus six weeks ago. Having seen Daryl fight at the estate, Isabel believed he was the best candidate to take Laurent to the community. Daryl, however, ignored her pleas and prepared to pick a few weapons and leave the convent. Meanwhile, the woman and the elderly man, who had previously stolen Daryl's supplies, were suddenly stopped by a car. The tattooed leader of the group demanded to know if they had seen his men. The old man tried to lie but was brutally beaten by the tattooed leader. Panicked, the woman confessed to seeing them. The old man quickly interjected, asking if there was a reward for the information, only to be killed instantly by a blow from the tattooed leader. The woman, no longer daring to trick them, let herself be taken by the group. They soon arrived at the village where the fight had taken place earlier. The tattooed leader found his men, now turned zombies, including his own brother, who wanted to bite him using unbrushed teeth. With reluctance, he sent his brother to bite zombie Satan in hell, his face showing lingering pain. Seeing that, the woman quickly blamed everything on a long-haired American referring to Daryl. At that moment, someone found a brochure for the convent. Dropping the sexy woman without any harassment, the tattooed leader rushed towards the convent, furious. Meanwhile, as Daryl finished packing his bags ready to leave, Laurent waved goodbye, implying that they would meet again. But Sister Isabel hadn't given up on persuading him. She insisted that Laurent was humanity's hope. She said if the prophecy proved wrong, at least he would have done a good deed by giving the boy a chance for a better life in the community. But what if the prophecy proved right? Daryl, however, remained cold and detached, saying that it didn't matter to him. He then decisively left the convent. But no sooner had he stepped out than he noticed a group of armed militia heading towards the convent. Confronted with the threatening barrels of their guns, the old nun had no choice but to open the door, allowing them to search the premises. However, these nuns were no pushovers. They were all armed and ready for a fight. The tattooed leader and his men circled around, but didn't find the long-haired Daryl. Instead, they came upon the zombified priest. In a fit of anger, the leader ordered his men to kill the zombie priest. Laurent, who had been hiding in a secret room, saw the priest who had raised him take his last breath and impulsively charged out, ready to wrestle his skinny muscles with them. In a world overrun by zombies, a young boy like Laurent was an invaluable resource. The leader ordered his men to take Laurent away, but just then Daryl appeared to flex his long hair and scar, causing a distraction. The robbers scattered, pursuing him instead, leaving only three men to chase the fleeing boy. However, they were soon stopped by a group of nuns wielding cold weapons. As bullets flew, the bulletproof nuns charged forward, driven by hope. Meanwhile, Daryl was caught up in a fierce fight with the pursuing militia. Although he managed to take out a few of their number, his injuries were not fully healed, and he was eventually knocked down by the tattoo-faced leader. Fortunately, Sister Isabel arrived just in time to help. Daryl managed to pick up a pistol, but only managed to hit the leader's arm. As he prepared to take another shot, he found the gun empty and could only watch helplessly as the leader drove away. Returning to the convent, Daryl found the garden littered with the bodies of the nuns. Their sacrifice had ensured Laurent's safety. The gravely injured head nun took Daryl's hand and told him this might be fate's design and suggested he place his bets on hope. Seeing the head nun's unwavering expression even in death, Daryl had an epiphany. Perhaps the hope he was meant to pursue wasn't Rick's group, but the courage to lead humanity out of this zombie crisis. Daryl finally found a new mission, to escort young Laurent to the survivor community in the north. He knew the journey would be fraught with challenges, but he was ready to face them without regret. Meanwhile, at a port in northern France, a ship's captain reported to the leader that a prisoner named Daryl had incited a mutiny, delaying their return by several months. Although he had stolen a boat and likely drowned at sea, the female chieftain, ruthless as ever, insisted that without seeing Daryl's body, they must continue to search for him. Daryl and his group set off to escort the chosen child to the survivor's community in northern France. They heard the final destination was Paris. Sister Isabel fell into memories of her life before the zombie virus outbreak. She had lived in bustling Paris, leading a lavish lifestyle until one fateful day on her way home. She saw people fighting, so she stepped back and turned towards the subway station, only to find the approaching train not slowing down. 
Chaos erupted inside the carriage as passengers screamed like loud chickens to escape for their shitty lives. As Isabel puzzled over the situation, she saw someone on the platform moving stiffly, attacking passers-by. Terrified, she immediately turned and ran out of the station, only to find the streets even more chaotic. Some were trapped in cars, twitching slightly. On closer inspection, one showed a gory, bloodied face. Isabel turned pale with fright, watching the panicked crowd run past. She didn't understand what had befallen the city when suddenly a car sped up, knocking a zombie aside. Her boyfriend had arrived, intent on taking her away from Paris. However, Isabel refused. She couldn't possibly leave her sister behind to fend for herself. Returning home to pick up her sister, the three of them began their journey out of Paris. At a rest area, her sister suddenly felt unwell. Isabel's boyfriend was disgusted and kept his distance, suspecting a zombie virus infection. Under Isabel's persistent questioning, it turned out her sister was pregnant. Her boyfriend pulled Isabel aside, arguing that her sister's condition was not suited for long travel, especially since their destination lacked medical facilities. He suggested they abandon her at a clinic along the way. Isabel pretended to agree, but she stealthily took the car keys from her boyfriend's pocket. While he was distracted on a call, she drove off with her sister. To Isabel, a hundred boyfriends could never equal the importance of her sister. Her reminiscing was abruptly halted as their cart stopped, refusing to move forward. Suddenly, a large group of zombies burst from a nearby alley. Everyone tensed, gripping their weapons, only Daryl remained calm. He untied the donkey and with a gunshot startled it into a sprint, drawing the entire horde away. Though they had escaped the immediate threat, they now had to proceed on foot. Passing through an abandoned village, Daryl heard a whistle from behind. Just as he turned, an arrow whizzed past his shoulder. He quickly chased after the attacker's silhouette, but unexpectedly walked into an ambush. As Daryl fell, he was quickly surrounded by a group armed with weapons. They soon arrived at an abandoned school campus, its entrance adorned with zombie heads, adding a chilling air to the once dignified school. Inside, Daryl met the kid's leader, Lou, a clever survivor who often quoted the Bible. Noticing that, Isabel revealed her nun's identity and falsely claimed Daryl was a priest. Their strategy worked and Lou's demeanor shifted from cold to welcoming. Not only did she release Daryl's bonds, but she also led them on a tour inside, showing them the dozens of children living there. Besides gathering supplies to sustain themselves, they also continued their education daily. Isabel couldn't help but exclaim at Lou's achievements. Shaking her head, Lou led her to the back room where an elder, their mentor, who had taken in homeless children and taught them to survive, lay gravely ill. Unfortunately, the elder had contracted a disease months earlier. Lou's only recourse was to pray devoutly by her bedside each day, hoping for her recovery. No wonder she was so welcoming to a priest and a nun. As evening approached, all the children gathered around the long table ready for dinner. Laurent chose a spot to sit, but was quickly shooed away by a sidekick boy next to him. Lou explained that the seat was reserved for a comrade who was out on missions. She then reminded Daryl that perhaps they should say a prayer before eating. Daryl, masquerading as a priest, couldn't easily refuse and awkwardly shared some personal reflections. While everyone was still mulling over his words, they were jolted by the loud slurping of Daryl's soup. The children, ever romantic, laughed and began to imitate his hearty sipping. After a filling meal, Daryl inquired about local transportation. Lou told him about an American living in a castle on the hill who owned a fine horse. However, she likened him to a dragon from legends, often descending the hill to raid their supplies. Daryl expressed a desire to meet this American man, but Lou was reluctant to let him take the risk since their previous attempts at raiding had always ended in failure. Suddenly, Daryl mentioned their mentor's illness, stressing that without medicine, the mentor might not last much longer. Lou hesitated, then reluctantly agreed. The sidekick boy wanted to join, but Lou sternly refused. As night fell, Daryl and the children watched an American soap opera. Amid the laughter, Daryl became contemplative, reminiscing about watching the same show with his brother when they were kids. When it was time to retire, Isabel couldn't help but lament how pitiful the children were, oblivious to what the world used to be like. Daryl, however, saw it differently. He believed that they were better off not pining for a world they never knew. This thought plunged Isabel back into her memories. After abandoning her boyfriend with her sister, they had intended to seek medical help but stumbled upon an ambulance with a zombie inside. Her sister was bitten while boarding the vehicle. In a panic, Isabel fled with her sister to a convent where a nun tended to her sister's wounds, predicting a swift zombification. Isabel encouraged her sister to hold on, not just for herself but for the unborn child. 
Miraculously, her sister managed to survive until the child's birth before turning into a zombie. Meanwhile, Daryl and Lou were on their way to the mountain castle. Lou revealed that their last raid there was just a month ago, and she was the only survivor. The sidekick boy's brother had died there. To spare everyone's feelings, Lou claimed he was on a mission, thus his seat at the table remained vacant. Upon reaching the castle gates, they found not water, but a moat filled with zombies. The drawbridge was raised, indicating that entering would be challenging. They searched a nearby cabin for tools, but unexpectedly, Daryl locked Lou inside, believing he'd be safer entering alone. He then used the tools to successfully scale the drawbridge. Upon entering the castle, Daryl spotted a robust horse but remained cautious. He searched the rooms until he found a small storeroom full of medical supplies. Just then, he heard shouting from the basement. Opening the door, he found a young boy, one of Lou's raiding companions. Overjoyed, Daryl prepared to leave with him when a bullet whizzed by. The castle owner had finally appeared. Daryl took cover in the basement, facing a standoff. Unable to resolve the situation, he handed his gun to the boy, instructing him to cover while he made a dash from the basement. Lou, confined in the dark room, suddenly heard footsteps approaching. She quickly grabbed her bow and arrow, anxiously watching the door. Meanwhile, inside the castle, Daryl had successfully maneuvered behind the castle owner. Seizing the moment while the man was reloading, he sprinted forward and subdued him. Hearing Daryl's accent, the castle owner excitedly revealed that he too was an American. He mentioned having plenty of food and offered to share it with Daryl. However, what concerned Daryl was the castle owner's habit of raiding local supplies, forcing others into desperate situations. The castle owner pleaded, explaining that his actions were motivated by a need to survive and return to his family. Daryl was unmoved and decided to take him back to Lou for judgment. The castle owner was terrified, revealing that he had four children waiting for him at home. But Daryl advised him not to harbor any illusions. His hometown had fallen years ago. The old man's face turned ashen as Daryl cleared out all the supplies. As they crossed the drawbridge, the cart's wheels suddenly broke, causing several fuel cans to fall into the moat. While Daryl was busy fixing it, the castle owner tried to steal his rifle. In the ensuing struggle, both fell into the zombie-infested moat. Daryl, more fortunate, managed to fend off the zombies with sharp attacks, while the castle owner was left dangling from a rope, helplessly devoured by the zombies below. Daryl finally cleared a space and aimed his gun at the fallen fuel cans, wiping out many of the surrounding zombies. Just as more zombies began to gather, a sharp arrow flew in. Looking up, he saw Lou and the sidekick boy arriving to help. Daryl quickly climbed the castle wall using the rope. Lou couldn't help but tease him if he could really handle this alone. At that moment, the sidekick boy discovered his brother, who had turned into a zombie in the moat, and realized Lou had been deceiving him. Lou, silent, raised her bow to end the zombie brother's suffering but couldn't bring herself to shoot. In the end, it was Daryl who took the shot, helping her resolve the painful situation. The group returned to the school camp with the supplies, only to find that the mentor had already passed away. Lou was overwhelmed with grief and panic. Without the mentor, they were uncertain about their future. Daryl encouraged her, saying she had done well so far and urged her to keep going. After attending the memorial service, Laurent expressed a desire to stay and live there, but Sister Isabel forcefully took him to leave. The little boy wondered if he was really that special. Isabel's eyes, firm and certain, conveyed that Laurent's birth was nothing short of a miracle. Indeed, the baby boy that Isabel's sister had given birth to before turning into a zombie was Laurent, now grown up. Not just her, but all the nuns and priests in the convent believed Laurent was the most special being. The group set off again, determinedly heading toward their destination, unaware that their old nemesis, the tattooed leader, was slowly trailing them. Paris truly deserves its reputation as a world-class center of art. Even if its residents turned into zombies, they could seamlessly perform a symphony. Not long after leaving the Apocalypse School, Daryl and his companions arrive in a city. Sister Isabel, who had previously contacted a local liaison via radio, decides to meet them again. They quickly reach the entrance of an opera house, and Daryl and Isabel enter while instructing Laurent and the young nun to stay put. As they push open the door, a curly-haired, bald old man emerges, exuding an air of artistic flair. Isabel wants to use the Opera House's radio to try and connect with the Northern community, but the bald artist reveals he has repurposed the radio components for his musical instruments. He then nervously asks if they like music. Confused, Daryl and Isabel follow him into the Grand Auditorium, where chaotic TikTok music fills the air. 
To their shock, they see countless zombies playing various instruments on stage, with the bald artist gleefully conducting. Daryl curses under his breath at the sight of the zombies strapped to the instruments, a setup where any slight movement triggers musical sounds, an act of madness only a true eccentric could concoct. Back outside, the noise quickly attracts a zombie towards Laurent and the young nun. The young nun hesitates to shoot, fearing more zombies might come. At that moment, Daryl intervenes, swiftly eliminating the zombie with a rifle. The loud noise attracts even more zombies towards the opera house. Daryl decides to leave in the horse-drawn cart, letting the zombies swarm into the opera house. It seems the bald artist might not be able to play his zombie symphony anymore. After a day's journey, Daryl's group finally reaches the outskirts of Paris. The sight of the Eiffel Tower, so close, fills Laurent with excitement, having only seen it in books before. For Sister Isabel, the emotions are more complex as this is her homeland. Soon, they encounter a group of local survivors led by a man who has heard of Laurent's messianic reputation thanks to Isabel's prior radio communications. The group is then led to a closed community housing over 60 survivors who rotate duties to gather supplies and have cultivated an abundance of fruits and vegetables, achieving self-sufficiency. Daryl notices the damaged tip of the Eiffel Tower, explained by the leader as the result of a military helicopter crash at the outbreak of the virus. When a communications officer approaches, Daryl is excited about finally using the radio to contact the northern community, only to find out they use pigeons for communication. Delays can stretch up to a month in bad weather. Daryl quickly loses patience, thinking that once he delivers Laurent here, his job is done and he can start planning his return to the USA. The leader mentions a nearby trading market where Daryl might find what he needs, though it requires trading valuable goods. Isabel reassures him, confident in her ability to procure valuable items. Laurent's identity has quickly spread, and the survivors indeed treat him as a savior. The little boy, appearing to possess a special ability to see through people, quickly brings a smile to a gloomy woman's face with just a few words. Meanwhile, the tattooed leader, who was determined to avenge his younger brother, arrived in Paris. He proactively approached the organization that had announced their intention to capture Daryl alive, offering his help to catch the American and producing a radio Daryl had left behind in a church as evidence. The chieftain didn't respond, but took him to the laboratory next door. Inside a transparent room stood a zombie, its hands bound and body twitching violently. As it struggled, it suddenly snapped the iron chains and lunged at the crowd. However, in the next moment, it collapsed in a pool of blood. The chieftain was dissatisfied, believing the drug's effect lasted too short. The next morning, Isabel took Daryl to her former residence, a place already ransacked countless times. Amid the ruins, a photo in a broken frame showed Isabel's sister, the mother Laurent, had never met. Isabel then retrieved a metal box from a hidden compartment containing enough jewelry and gold for any transaction. Daryl looked out the window at the vine-covered streets, reminiscing about the area's past beauty. Isabel, thoughtful after listening, mused that this might be their motivation to keep going. As they prepared to leave, they found the doorway blocked by zombies, forcing Isabel to lead Daryl out the back. Upon opening the back door, they were stunned to see a zombified little girl standing alone in the backyard. Daryl moved to eliminate her, but Isabel stopped him, recognizing the girl. It turns out when the virus first broke out, Isabel had hesitated and not taken the girl with her, resulting in the current predicament, filling her with guilt. As the girl struggled against the vines, she knocked over a flower pot, attracting the attention of zombies upstairs who began jumping out of the windows. As the zombies gathered, Daryl tried to use a wooden stick to pry open the vine-entangled gate. He managed to escape the courtyard by impaling a zombie against the gate, its blood corroding the vines quickly. After reuniting with Laurent and others, Isabel presented her sister's photo and the little boy finally saw his mother's face for the first time, excitedly showing it around. Before long, under the guidance of the leader, they reached a nearby market, surprisingly built in an underground catacomb surrounded by walls made of plague victims' bones, emitting a chilling and grim aura. Pushing open a heavy door, they stepped into another world where young men and women danced carefree, oblivious to any apocalyptic atmosphere. Intrigued, Daryl looked around, having not seen such scenes in years. Soon the leader introduced a trader who could help Daryl return to America, demanding payment first. Daryl was reluctant to leave Isabel behind, but the trader pulled out a knife. At that moment, a long-haired man appeared, shocking Isabel. It was Quinn, her former boyfriend she had abandoned. The trader hastily apologized to Quinn, who slashed his nose for carrying a weapon, violating the venue's rules. 
Isabel was still shocked at seeing Quinn here. Years had passed, and it seemed Quinn had done well, now managing the venue. He led Isabel and the others to a basement, where the old lovers reunited without awkwardness or mention of past grievances. Learning that Isabel's sister had died, leaving behind a son, Quinn revealed he was actually Laurent's father, shocking Isabel Moore, who was unaware of any past involvement between Quinn and her sister. Quinn offered to help Daryl return to America on the condition that he leave his son Laurent with him. Daryl, not wanting Isabel to suffer further, declared he'd rather swim back to the U.S. than accept Quinn's favor. However, Isabel was somewhat tempted, considering Quinn's strong position could be beneficial for Laurent. Feeling used, Daryl decided to pack up and head home, wanting no further part in these troubles. Before long, the tattooed leader showed up at the venue with a gang of thugs looking for Daryl. Quinn was set to intervene, but upon learning they were on Madame Genet's errand, he froze on the spot because he knew Madame Genet, the gang leader of a growing nationalist movement in France, had been conducting zombie research experiments. Since it's rumored that Quinn's son Laurent is seen as a savior, he was likely to be captured and studied closely by Madame Genet. Whether Laurent truly carries a virus antibody remains unclear. Meanwhile, Daryl, oblivious to the danger, was packing up to leave. Isabella suggested that leaving might upset Laurent, but Daryl was in a foul mood and told her to make up any story. After all, Isabella was good at lying. She explained that she didn't want to hide anything, just hadn't figured out how to broach the subject. Frustrated, Daryl remarked that she was overthinking everything, asking if it was so hard to tell Laurent he has a father and he might soon realize he's just an ordinary kid. But their entire conversation was overheard by Laurent, who was standing behind them. The boy said he hated them and ran off. Just then, the door burst open, and the tattooed leader and his crew stormed in to flex his tattoo. Daryl told Isabella to find Laurent while he led the pursuers upstairs. As they dashed through a corridor filled with zombies, Daryl didn't hesitate to jump over, followed closely by the tattooed leader. The two engaged in a fierce brawl on the rooftop, with Daryl gaining the upper hand. Just as he was about to finish the tattooed leader, one of the henchmen appeared for backup, forcing Daryl to flee. He hadn't run far when the ground beneath him cracked open and he accidentally fell into a building swarming with horrifying zombies. After regaining his footing, he used a flashlight to find a locked iron door. Suddenly, he heard zombie roars like gooses. Seeing Laurent not far away, he yelled for him to run for safety, but the boy stood motionless, hands clasped as the zombies engulfed him. Daryl was frantic, but surprisingly, the zombies bypassed Laurent and moved on. Seeing Laurent's indifferent eyes shocked and confused Daryl. Suddenly, he woke up from a dream in a pool of water, realizing it was all a nightmare. Nearby floated a zombie, which Daryl quickly dispatched. He was relieved that his fall had landed him in a water pool, which saved him from worse injuries. After regaining some strength, Daryl began searching for Laurent. With vehicles occasionally passing by, it seemed this place was far from peaceful. Sure enough, Madame Genet had learned about Daryl's whereabouts from the survivor's community. Having heard of the hopeful Laurent, she didn't dismiss it as mere rumors. Believing the boy had something special, and with her ongoing zombie research, she immediately ordered her men to capture Laurent and offered a hefty reward for information on his whereabouts. This news soon reached the ears of Quinn, the bar owner and Laurent's biological father. He wouldn't stand by idly and immediately gathered his men to find the boy. Unfamiliar with the local roads, Daryl planned to seek help from the survivor's community, but at the gate, he stumbled upon the communication expert who used pigeons rather than radios. Learning that Laurent and Sister Isabella hadn't been captured, Daryl breathed a sigh of relief. Just then, a car roared nearby, and he quickly pulled the pigeon man aside. To their dismay, the car's armed occupants were eyeing the pigeons. The pigeon man didn't hesitate to jump out to stop them, but was fatally shot. Daryl, infuriated, threw a dagger, hitting the robber. Sadly, the pigeon man was near death and asked Daryl to release the pigeons with his last breath. Watching the pigeons fly freely into the sky, the pigeon man passed away, leaving Daryl silent and shaken. Not long after, Daryl met up with Isabella at her home. Any previous misunderstandings dissolved with a hug but without a hormone yoga session. Their primary concern now was finding Laurent. Daryl had an idea. He pulled Isabella with him and headed out, guessing that Laurent's unfamiliarity with the area would lead him only to the Eiffel Tower. As expected, the little boy had already made his way near the tower. Neglected for many years, this landmark had fallen into disrepair. He raced to the base of the tower and discovered it surrounded by sandbags as tall as a person. Curiously peering through, he was shocked to find it filled with bloodthirsty zombies. 
Sensing the approach of a living human, the ferocious zombies actually managed to topple the sandbags and surged towards Laurent like a tidal wave. Fortunately, at that moment, Daryl and Isabel arrived just in time. Without hesitation, they plunged into the crowd of zombies, wrestling their muscles, wielding their sharp weapons, and quickly began to clear the perimeter of the undead. Smartly, Laurent hid under a cover, waiting for Daryl to draw closer. But suddenly, in the next moment, the head of a zombie appeared in his field of vision, leaving him utterly stunned. Suddenly, the cover was lifted by two strangers who appeared and attempted to kidnap Laurent. Daryl quickly intervened, but it was a step too late. The driver floored the accelerator, whisking Laurent away. Daryl's heart sank as he took the abandoned kidnapper to a secluded spot. Initially defiant, the kidnapper would reveal nothing but swear dirty words, faced with Isabel's relentless questioning. However, Isabel managed to deduce from his few words that he was likely an underling of her former boyfriend, Quinn. Indeed, at that moment, Laurent was sitting in Quinn's bar, calmly eating candy in the presence of his biological father. Quinn reassured Laurent to relax, expressing a desire to make up for the years of neglect. Laurent quickly inquired about Isabel and Daryl's well-being, to which Quinn firmly promised that they would all meet soon. Meanwhile, Daryl was puzzled about why Quinn would kidnap Laurent. If he claimed to want to be a good father, that was simply impossible. Seeing that the captive refused to confess, Daryl delivered a heavy punch, tired of Isabel's gentle interrogation methods. He grabbed a long iron spike from the table and repeatedly stabbed the kidnapper in the stomach. The man's face twisted in pain, and he immediately confessed to being Quinn's trusted lieutenant, revealing that the kidnapping was intended to lure Isabel back to him. Unwilling to allow this, Daryl demanded to know if there were secret passages into Quinn's bar. The kidnapper nodded, offering to draw a map, but Daryl insisted on him leading the way personally. Soon, Isabel was joined by the leader of the survivor's community, who had significant influence in the area. They needed a foolproof plan, given Quinn's substantial local power. After discussing, they split into three groups and set off in different directions. The community's warriors headed directly to Quinn's bar, Daryl with the kidnapper towards the secret passage, and Isabel with the young nun to the canal docks to arrange a boat in advance for a swift escape via water after rescuing Laurent. However, the kidnapper revealed crucial information that Quinn controlled all the waterways in Paris, unbeknownst to Daryl that his escape route was compromised. Led by the kidnapper, Daryl quickly reached a sewer beneath the hills, the secret entrance to Quinn's bar. Meanwhile, Quinn had cunningly invited Madame Genet to his bar, eyeing the high reward she had offered. Confidently, he promised to hand over Daryl, not for food or fuel, but for a famous painting in Madame Genet's collection, to which she agreed without hesitation. However, when she inquired about the whereabouts of the young boy Laurent, Quinn pretended to be unaware. His strategy was indeed clever, not only keeping Isabel tied to him through Laurent, but also plotting to eliminate the troublesome Daryl. Shortly after Madame Genet left, the warriors from the survivors' camp reached the door of Quinn's bar. They did not force their way in, but instead created chaos by firing shots outside. The sound of the intense battle quickly reached Daryl's ears and also woke the zombies sleeping in the tunnel. The kidnapper, attempting to escape in the confusion, accidentally twisted his ankle. Daryl quickly caught up, confirmed the route ahead, and left without hesitation, abandoning the poor kidnapper to be overwhelmed by the restless zombie horde. As the community leader at the bar's entrance noticed an increasing number of guards gathering, he had no choice but to quickly retreat with his injured subordinate. This diversion tactic worked exceptionally well. Daryl successfully infiltrated the bar through a secret passage, while the guards rushed to the entrance to provide support, completely unaware of the intruder's presence. Before long, Daryl made his way into the room where Laurent was located, only to find Quinn's current girlfriend there as well. After a moment's consideration with a gun in her hand, she surprisingly let Laurent leave. She clearly understood that if Isabel returned to Quinn's side, her own fate in this post-apocalyptic world would be uncertain. When Quinn saw what was happening at the entrance, he quickly realized he had been tricked. By the time he ran back to Laurent's room, he encountered Daryl in a narrow passage. The two quickly engaged in a scuffle, wrestling their muscles rather than tongues. Having survived countless life-and-death battles, Daryl easily overpowered Quinn. However, just as he was about to finish Quinn off, he suddenly thought about the implications of killing Laurent's father in front of him and decided it was inappropriate. Casually, he put away his knife. Laurent, with a complex expression, glanced at his unconscious father and then followed Daryl out of the bar. 
Meanwhile, at the canal docks, Isabel had successfully met up with the community warriors. Fortunately, only one person was injured in the conflict, and after tending to his wounds, Daryl arrived with Laurent. After this ordeal, the young boy finally realized that only Daryl and Isabel truly cared for him. Daryl interrupted the reunion, reminding them that it was time to leave. However, Isabel shook her head, indicating that Quinn controlled all the waterways. She wanted to go back and persuade him to let Daryl and Laurent pass. Otherwise, no one would be able to leave. Although the boy was reluctant to part with Isabel for the sake of their greater mission, he had to endure the pain of separation. Daryl also had to abandon his plans to return to his home country, continuing to escort the boy to their final destination. The dangerous journey that lay ahead would now be undertaken by just the two of them. Gazing at the distant Eiffel Tower, they wondered when they would finally return home. Back at the bar, Quinn was not surprised by Isabel's proactive visit. Indeed, everything was still under his control. Daryl and Laurent boarded a Tesla boat with full self-driving to leave Paris. From the boatmen, they learned that the outpost camp was just over 200 miles away. Daryl's heart lightened considerably. As long as he could ensure Laurent's safe arrival, he could return home and reunite with his friends. Daryl's thoughts drifted back to a past mission when he had encountered a man driving a car. Noticing that Daryl's motorcycle was out of fuel, the man offered some in exchange for help with a simple task. Driven by his eagerness to return home, Daryl followed the man to a repair shop where many people were already gathered, preparing for a task. Among them was a young boy about Laurent's age. Daryl was curious about the mission and soon learned from the leader that their task was to capture zombies in the wild. At that time, Daryl, armed with his crossbow, reached the human limit of combat power and captured the most zombies of anyone there. The admiration from everyone was unanimous, and the young boy even became an enthusiastic fan. The number of zombies each person contributed directly determined how much fuel they received. Daryl was curious about why these people were collecting zombies but didn't dwell on it. He just needed enough fuel to get home. He then turned and walked towards the storehouse, where he unexpectedly found a radio. He quickly picked up the handset to contact his mother, only to hear her say, he's back, before the communication was completely cut off. Daryl didn't catch who she was referring to. The next morning, as Daryl was preparing to head home, he suddenly saw an old man with a white beard leading a few zombies back to the camp, including the young boy, now a zombie. Noticing the strangulation marks on his neck, Daryl deduced he had been killed by the white-bearded man. It was disheartening to realize that in a zombie apocalypse, a human life was worth less than a barrel of oil. Back to the present, Daryl glanced at Laurent, who was fishing, and then followed the boatman to the shore's resting spot. Soon after they settled in their room, Laurent came over with a fish. Daryl was about to teach him how to gut the fish when the boy immediately protested, saying that fishing was just for fun, and he had never intended to eat the animal. Daryl then began to instill in him the concept of survival of the fittest, asserting that there's nothing humans can't do to survive. After their meal, as night completely fell, the innocent Laurent sat in a corner praying for Daryl's friends like Rick's daughter and wife, believing that Daryl, a man without faith, wouldn't know how to pray. The kind-hearted boatman, knowing Daryl's homesickness, promised to arrange a route back to his country once they reached the outpost camp. In the dead of night, Daryl was suddenly awoken by the sound of scattered footsteps. A zombie had approached their tent, and he quickly dispatched it with a knife. He immediately had a bad feeling, and sure enough, several more zombies lay outside the tent. The boatman, who had been on watch, was now barely alive, leaning against a large tree with several zombie bites on his body. Knowing his end was near, the boatman pulled out his pocket watch and gave it to Daryl, telling him that following the river downstream would lead to the outpost camp. He then peacefully closed his eyes. The next morning, at the crack of dawn, Daryl buried the body of the boatman, wishing him a happy journey to heaven. His face was eerily composed, a result of too many harsh farewells in his past. However, when the two reached the riverbank, they discovered that the Tesla boat, which had been tied to a tree, was gone, as if it drove itself away with its FSD. Observing the clean cut on the rope, Daryl deduced that Laurent had severed it. His anger skyrocketed, and he loudly demanded to know why Laurent had done such a stupid thing. With tears in his eyes, Laurent confessed that he knew Daryl would leave him upon reaching the camp, and he couldn't bear the thought of being alone. At this, Daryl's anger dissipated, and he decided they would proceed on foot, comforting Laurent along the way and reassuring him that the people at the camp were friendly, and Isabel would also try to meet up with them. Just then, the sound of a car engine roared in the distance. 
Daryl quickly pulled Laurent aside to hide, but inadvertently, a few items fell out of his backpack. Realizing trouble was imminent, Daryl handed his pocket watch to Laurent and told him to run ahead while he stayed behind to buy time. As expected, the robbers in the car, upon seeing the Bible and toys scattered on the ground, jumped out and began searching the area. Daryl attempted a sneak attack but was quickly spotted. The gang, each armed with sophisticated weapons and clearly targeting them, soon captured Daryl. Laurent, unable to leave Daryl to face his fate alone, bravely revealed himself, and both were taken captive by the bandits. Meanwhile, Isabel had just woken up in a luxurious suite, guarded by armed patrols pacing the corridor. She sighed, knowing that for Daryl and Laurent to have any chance of escaping Paris, she had to compromise and return to her ex-boyfriend, Quinn. Quinn, still hopelessly in love, cherished the memories of their time together and sincerely hoped for reconciliation. Isabel was cautious not to outright reject him, claiming that her lengthy stay in a convent had made her forget how to love. Quinn was undeterred and continued his relentless charm offensive. However, Isabel's mind was set on escaping to reunite with Laurent. After searching the room thoroughly, she found a piece of metal behind a picture frame and made it into a deadly weapon. That night, Quinn arranged a candlelit dinner, hoping to bridge the distance between them. Isabel changed her usual indifferent demeanor, moving closer, her hidden blade ready. Just as she was about to act, Quinn's heartfelt confession of his attempts at redemption touched her, and she couldn't bring herself to strike this hormone guy. Sensing a shift in Isabel's attitude, Quinn left the room smugly, only to encounter his current girlfriend fuming at the doorstep, her actions signaling a definitive end to their relationship. The following day, Quinn, dressed impressively, casually invited Isabel to a gathering, which she accepted without hesitation. It turns out she had received a secret note from Quinn's girlfriend, hinting at a significant revelation at the event. Driven by curiosity, Isabel followed Quinn to a bustling urban center, a stronghold of one of the world's most powerful forces. Led by the guards, Isabel soon found herself inside a castle and face to face with Madame Genet, Daryl's old adversary, which filled her with foreboding. Passing by a prison, she spotted the last person she wanted to see. It's Daryl who had been captured. Quinn's girlfriend, visibly bitter, had obviously divulged Daryl's whereabouts, and for his part in Daryl's escape, Quinn had also been imprisoned by Madame Genet. Fortunately, Laurent was not mistreated, but treated as a guest of honor by Madame Genet, who knew of his miraculous birth from a zombie, symbolizing humanity's resurgence. Many saw him as a savior, and Madame Genet planned to use his influence to silence her dissenters. Laurent instinctively opposed this, but Madame Genet gave him no choice. That night, she led him to a massive square filled with shouting supporters, proclaiming the establishment of a free state for humanity amidst the apocalypse. Laurent, standing beside her, dared not utter a word, realizing he had become nothing more than a tool. Meanwhile, Daryl was being led out of his cell. As he took in his surroundings, memories of a similar past event came flooding back. Daryl had gotten into a fight with the white-bearded old man, and both ended up captured by a zombie gang and transported onto a massive cargo ship. Daryl quickly identified the escape boat's location, but soon found himself distracted by the zombies in the cage. Unbeknownst to him, these people were collecting zombies for Madame Genet. Before long, Daryl and the white-bearded man were locked in an iron cage. Daryl was puzzled, not understanding why they were capturing so many living people. His question was answered at midnight when a group of thugs burst into the cage, randomly selected a fellow prisoner, and pushed him into a cage full of zombies. It turned out that the living captives were merely food for the zombies. Daryl immediately pretended to be sick, lying flat on the ground. Seeing this, the guard opened the iron door again and dragged him to the front of the zombie-filled cage. Seizing the moment when no one was paying attention, Daryl quickly overpowered the guard, grabbed the keys and unlocked all the cages holding the zombies, not forgetting his fellow inmate. Soon, the entire ship was overrun with zombies, allowing Daryl and the white-bearded man to make their escape toward the only available lifeboat. Cheers from the crowd snapped Daryl back to the present. Standing in the center of the square, he listened as Madame Genet publicly declared his crimes aboard the cargo ship and announced that he would be severely punished. She also intended to showcase her latest research achievement. As she finished speaking, a robust zombie was pushed into the center of the square. When a syringe was plunged into the zombie's neck, Daryl immediately sensed trouble, recalling a similarly strong zombie on the ship that had instantly ended the white-bearded man's bearded life with a single blow. Knowing he couldn't win a direct fight, Daryl leaped into the sea. 
Back in the present, facing an even stronger zombie, he had to prepare to face this formidable enemy, which was enhanced with a special serum that significantly boosted its agility and strength. But Daryl, ever calm in the face of danger, grabbed the axe and struck. When the mutated zombie rose again, he switched from chopping to stabbing, pinning it against a column. Just as Daryl thought the fight was over, the zombie forcefully freed itself. Daryl had to dodge and grab a flagpole as a weapon, spearing the zombie and sending it flying like a Barbie toy before finally plunging the flagpole into its head. Madame Genet, her face dark with anger by the sight, ordered her men to unleash their strongest move. The side door of the arena opened and Quinn was brought out by several guards. Daryl thought a duel was coming, but unexpectedly, a thick iron chain linked them together. As the lights in the dark arena turned on, zombies appeared around the perimeter. With the special serum injected, the zombies became increasingly aggressive, although one failed mutation caused its head to explode instantly, drawing boos from the audience. Clearly, Madame Genet's mutant serum wasn't always successful. Just then, the chains on the zombies were released. Daryl and Quinn were ready, but to their relief, two of the zombies began fighting among themselves. The pair took advantage of this, using the chain to restrain the zombies and their axes to cut them down. When Quinn was tackled by a zombie who mistook him for a sexy lady, Daryl quickly wrapped the chain around its neck and decapitated it with a powerful tug, ending the zombie's flirty life. The cheers from the crowd were overwhelming, proving that in this post-apocalyptic world, decisive killers were revered. Madame Genet, seeing her plan backfire, decided to abandon all pretenses of honor and ordered her men to kill Daryl directly. However, gunfire erupted from within the crowd first, coming from community residents who had infiltrated the audience. Chaos ensued at the arena, and Madame Genet quickly fled for her shitty life under the protection of her guards. Once she was safe, she ordered her men to ensure Daryl's death and sent the tattooed leader to assist in the mission. Meanwhile, Laurent and Isabel were temporarily imprisoned. Fortunately, Daryl and Quinn had already escaped amid the chaos. Dodging a group of pursuing guards, Daryl soon discovered that Quinn had been bitten during the fight. Despite Quinn's grave expression indicating he was unharmed, he soon felt weak. Knowing they couldn't escape quickly enough because of the dragging chain, Daryl tried but failed to break it. Quinn shook his head, accepting his fate, and urged Daryl to go and save Isabel. Understanding the implication, Daryl didn't hesitate to help Quinn stretch out his arm and then severed it with one clean axe stroke. Watching the pursuers slowly close in, Quinn let out a loud, goose roar and charged into the crowd for his final showdown, while Daryl seized the opportunity to run outside. The city guards were numerous. Daryl wanted to find a car to break through, but unexpectedly ran into the community leader. He asked him to prepare a vehicle, while he went back to rescue Isabel and Laurent. Turning to Isabel and Laurent, they hadn't resigned themselves to fate and waited for an opportunity to escape. Isabel pulled a key from her pocket, which she had stolen from a guard earlier. They quickly left the jail, but avoiding the many guards was not an easy task. After several twists and turns, they bumped into Daryl running back. However, a metal gate separated them. As he was about to pick the lock, a roar suddenly came from around the corner. It was Quinn, who had turned into a zombie. Isabel was immediately entangled by him. Daryl shouted and easily dispatched the approaching zombies, but now, saving Isabel depended on Laurent. The boy, who usually couldn't even muster the courage to kill a fish, swung a large axe at the zombified Quinn for Isabel's safety. With the help of the community leader, they finally escaped the clutches of Madame Genet's influence, bidding farewell to their comrades from the survivor community. As they headed for the outpost, Isabel noticed Laurent's gloom and comforted him, explaining that taking lives for survival was sometimes unavoidable. Laurent had already understood this and said that God would forgive his actions if there were no other choices. Moreover, after turning into a zombie, Quinn was no longer his father. Suddenly, Daryl noticed the vehicle had broken down and pulled over in an open area. Perhaps sensing their impending separation, the two began sharing their pasts. Daryl revealed his father had been a soldier who died in Paris on a mission, leaving his mother to struggle to raise him alone. He vowed not to follow in his father's footsteps and was determined to safely return home. Isabel then confessed that the prophecy painting of Daryl as a divine messenger by the sea was actually hurriedly made by Laurent under her command, so as to better persuade Daryl to take on the escort task. Daryl just smiled and didn't respond. Suddenly, noticing the silence outside, he stood up and saw that the tattooed leader had surrounded them with his men. Isabel tried to resist, but was stabbed in the back instantly. 
The guard captain ordered the tattooed leader to kill everyone, including the young boy Laurent. Looking into the clear eyes of the boy, the tattooed leader hesitated for a few seconds, then suddenly turned his gun on his comrades. It turns out, after recognizing the destination from the pattern on a pocket watch, he decided not to seek revenge on Daryl, allowing him to complete his escort mission first. Before leaving, he reminded them that they were tracked down by the tracks of their vehicle. Daryl had never expected that the tattooed leader, known for his cruelty, could be influenced by Laurent. It seems that this child might be the prophesied savior. When the tattooed leader returned to base to report, he lied that their own overconfidence had led them into Daryl's ambush, resulting in their total annihilation. Madame Genet, long accustomed to power, saw through the lie instantly. It was impossible that all his comrades died while he escaped unscathed. Without arguing, the tattooed leader felt that the boy had a special charisma that might indeed lead the survivors to a new world, so he chose to kill his comrades and let him go. Madame Genet shook her head in sorrow, believing that only a firm hand could stabilize people's hearts and undue spiritual reliance would only weaken them. She then ordered her men to take the tattooed leader away to be fed to the zombies. At this point, Daryl and his companions had reached the dry coastline, where a majestic ancient castle stood not far off. This was their final destination, the outpost camp. The residents warmly welcomed the arrival of the Savior Laurent, clearly showing that the person in charge here was a wise and kind leader. Isabel felt deeply satisfied, knowing Laurent finally had peers to play with. Moreover, with its proximity to the ocean, the camp was abundant in resources. The residents were well-fed and amiable towards everyone. The only regret was the departure of Daryl. Isabel made one last attempt to persuade Daryl to stay, but he had made up his mind. Having completed his escort mission, returning to his homeland was essential for him, as there were significant others waiting for him there. The camp leader was very understanding and immediately arranged for a merchant ship bound for America. They would set sail early the day after tomorrow. Daryl silently returned to his room to pack his bags. Intending to leave quietly, Isabel, however, was already waiting at the door. She had much to say, but all her words ultimately condensed into a simple thank you. Daryl, showing a carefree demeanor, picked up his backpack and walked away. However, as he passed Laurent's room, he quietly placed the Rubik's Cube they had played with at the beginning of their acquaintance by the bed. After one last look at the Grand Outpost, Daryl continued towards the designated port, following the map across cliffs and through dried reeds. Just as he was about to reach his destination, he spotted a zombie hanging from a tree. This sight led him to a simple graveyard. It turned out to be the final resting place of his father's military unit. Somewhat stirred, Daryl checked the tombstones and finally found his father's name. Knowing his father was laid to rest and not wandering like a zombie was the greatest comfort for him. Just then, a ship's horn sounded from the sea. The merchant vessel had arrived to pick him up. Daryl waved his arms, shouting, but unfortunately, the noise awakened the sleeping zombies, who mistook him for a sexy lady. Fearlessly, Daryl wielded his hammer, mowing down zombies as he quickly made his way to the shoreline. But just then, he heard Laurent's cries from behind. Daryl was suddenly faced with a tough choice, either meet up with the ship at sea or go back to rescue Laurent from the zombies. The answer was, of course, obvious. The scene shifts to an old man who was speeding on a motorcycle on the highway when suddenly a car sped up to chase him. He quickly turned around, gun in hand, and forced the other vehicle to stop. The car door slowly opened, and an elderly woman stepped out. She bluntly asked about Daryl's whereabouts because the motorcycle was Daryl's. The man did not respond, but instead tried to search the car. The woman, not tolerating his behavior, knocked him out with a stick. Once his hands were tied, the man finally confessed that he had swapped for the motorcycle at a gas station. Without further ado, the woman rode the motorcycle towards the gas station. With that, season one of this drama comes to an end. This is Daniel CC Movie Channel. Stay safe and enjoy your day.